Okay, thanks everyone for coming back to the second portion of our uh, event today, which is a presentation given by our invited speaker, Heather Joseph, who is the director of, uh, executive direct, director of Spark. She leads the strategic and operational activities of Spark, and Heather has focused the Spark's effort on supporting new models for the open sharing of digital articles, data, and educational resources. Under her stewardship, Spark has become widely recognized as the leading international force for effective open access policies and practices. I hope you are as excited as I am to hear, um, to uh, look forward to hear Heather's insights on how open access can enhance research impact and help us with academic endeavors. Thank you, and let's welcome Heather. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. It was a, a privilege to get to hear my colleague Nicole speak. We work in the same office and yet I never really get to be in the audience. You made me think about things in a slightly different way, which is always extraordinarily useful. Um, hopefully we'll be able to think through this problem uh, from a variety of different angles today. Uh, the, the notion of um, uh, using open and open as an enabling strategy for enhancing the impact of the research and the work that we do on our campuses is certainly not a brand new concept, but the idea of how do we go about uh, uh, assigning value or even getting people to recognize that using open and open techniques, um, open platforms, open uh, channels for communicating our work uh, has a value, perhaps over and beyond using traditional ch ch uh, channels is definitely a new conversation on our campuses. So what I'm gonna to try to do today is to cover in the formal presentation, um, a, a, just a little bit of a refresher about uh, why open access, uh, why open access has come about, uh, what, it, what it purpose it's serving on our campuses and beyond, uh, talk a little bit very briefly uh, about some of the drivers behind it, um, touch on, I'm sure many people are familiar, but just to be sure, touch on some of the, the major channels for utilizing uh, open access in publishing research articles in specific, and then talk a bit about how we're currently um, uh, valuing uh, research articles, how they're being used in the tenure and promotion process, and how we might begin to think about different strategies for um, updating uh, the, the kinds of values that we're placing on uh, the, the, the work that we're doing on our campuses. Um, I'm going to see if it's this or it's this that moves it. Click the mouse pad. Oh, click the mouse pad. Okay. Clicking the mouse pad. There we go. Um, as Nicole noted earlier, um, earlier today, uh, Spark is a global coalition. We're a membership organization of, uh, of academic and research libraries. And we have a very specific mission statement. And the idea of mission is something that I'm going to come back to time and time again in this presentation, because we found it's a very important driver in the open environment. Um, our mission is uh, that we're committed to making open the default in research and education, right? Flipping that assumption that when you're doing your research, when you're thinking about teaching, right now we tend to think about only sharing when there's a compelling reason to share the work that we're doing. What we'd like to do is really work to make the, the reality on our campuses and beyond the opposite. That, the, that the, 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 the assumption is that we're going to share what we found out unless or until there's a compelling reason not to do so. Um, earlier this week, I was on uh, campus at University of Denver and the talk focused specifically on data. And you can believe there are lots of compelling reasons why you wouldn't want to immediately share every piece of data that you're collecting as you're collecting it. Um, so we do recognize that there's shades of uh, um, uh, uh, shades of open uh, that need to be acknowledged. But for us at our core, this is really what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do it for a reason, not just because open is better than closed, right? But because we believe that open as an enabling strategy can help us achieve specific aims. It can help us to help us to solve big problems and also to take advantage of opportunities and make new discoveries through leveraging open as, a, as an enabling strategy in sharing research articles, sharing research data, all kinds of the outputs of research, as well as the materials that we use uh, to uh, uh, promote education. Um, 
the, one of the reasons that we're here is, as Nicole mentioned, is that we have this phenomenal new, techno new technology. God, I'm getting older by the second as I talk about this stuff. My first job was with the American Astronomical Society as a journal publisher, and it was 1989 that I started my job. So the internet was really just becoming something that was uh, uh, moving into the public's um, uh, awareness, and it became moved into my awareness when my boss, the executive director of the Astronomical Society said to me, here, you need to have what's called an email uh, address. And at the time, my first one was BitNet. I don't know if this is really dating me, but my second one was UUNet. You're nodding your head. So you're like aware of these like, UUNet. Um, so, and I was like, what is this coded language? People are never going to adopt this as a, as a communications tool. Well, I was completely wrong. My boss at the time was completely right. He said to me, you know, this is a network that's being developed by scientists to share science in real time, to collaborate on projects in real time, and to allow, and to allow us to do science in a digital age in a completely new way. And he was absolutely right. So we have this phenomenal new technology, right, that's designed to do this. And it gives us access to so much more information and the opportunity to do so much more with this information in a digital environment theoretically, right? And yet we all recognize that while the web has been um, absolutely optimized to do amazing things, like I can, and Nicole can attest to this, we can shoe shop to our heart's content and really use that web to, to do things so much more efficiently and better. And in some sense it's cheaper too. You can find good deals uh, to shop, to do, you know, I rebooked my canceled flight on the, sitting on the floor of national airport with my, my laptop open. Um, we've optimized the web to do things uh, it, terrifically um, in many environments, but not so much in, the sci in, in sharing uh, scientific research results in particular. What's really interesting is that despite the promise of this technology, the materials that we on our campuses most desperately need the freedom to work with, um, textbooks, data, scientific articles, uh, research outputs of all kinds still remain largely under sort of 20th century policies and practices. In particular, they remain under restrictive practices in terms to how we get access to them, how they're priced, and what we're allowed to do once we actually get our hands on them. And you run into this every day. What does this mean to you, right? And we have to think about, we try to think about it at Spark from the perspective of, of uh, um, everyone who's contributing and participating in the research enterprise um, on, on our campuses. Well, when we talk about the fact that, you know, the internet enables us to get access to a lot more information, that's a really great thing in theory. But the reality is that as, as disciplines go digital, um, the, the amount of new material that's available to us to work with and to try to digest and make sense of increases at an exponential rate year in and year out. And this is just a graph from one discipline, right? This is from genetics. And this looks at the increase in data that was submitted just to one database, to GenBank, over the period um, uh, uh, prior to the Human Genome Project, when the human genome was digitized and the material became openly available to scientists to work with. You see that the, the amount of information, the amount of data that's available going up on that ex exponential curve. And as much as I like a hockey stick curve because it looks like, you know, it's signaling something's good, something's moving, it's really hard to think about what this means to, watch, to us as individual scientists to try to make sense of this kind of, of information. My friend, Cam, friend and colleague Cameron Nalen likes to say, you know, the amount of information that I'm asked to deal with in this discipline, and I can tell you that this hockey stick curb is replicated in any discipline that begins to go digital from genetics to the humanities. Cameron likes to say, you know, I, I have all this new information to deal with, and yet I only have one brain, right? How do I think about going through and making sense of information in the digital environment that's available to me and that's this incredibly valuable resource in an analog fashion, right? That hockey stick curve represents data, but over the same time period, Articles reporting on insights into that data also went up by a, a similar trajectory. And if you're an individual scientist saying, okay, that's great, there's more information about my discipline in genetics, I wanna, I, I'm really interested in finding out what's going on with this particular gene or this particular causality, how am I, how am I to get through the amount of articles that I'm now 
asked to get through. If you look at that hockey stick curve for articles, um, uh, another colleague of mine, John Wilbanks, has estimated that a person would have to read on average about 100 articles per hour per day with no sleep to process just a year's worth of new articles that are coming out in that single discipline. That's simply not possible, right? So volume is great. We like to have access to increased information, but we need to have the ability, both technically, legally, and, and the ability to afford to do this, to utilize computers as a new category of reader to help us compute, text, data mine, move seamlessly through this incredible new volume of information in order to make sense and to really, really unlock the value of the information that we have access to. Um, so a problem on one, one hand to solve, an enormous opportunity to enable on the other hand. We also find, and you're well aware of this, that if we want to enable computers as a new category of reader, or if we ourselves simply want to find uh, uh, and, and amass a small collection to do text and data mining or compute on uh, specific elements in these digital articles, we have to have the rights to be able to do that. And largely we're living in a world where the copyright contract that we made in the print environment has simply been transferred to apply, to continue to apply in the digital environment. And I, again, I mentioned that my first job was as the journal publisher for the American Astronomical Society. And I was a journal publisher for scholarly societies primarily for 15 years in cell biology, neuroscience, uh, and astronomy, with a year out um, working for one of the world's largest commercial publishers, Elsevier Science. Um, so I do understand that copyright was never intended to be in the print environment in particular, uh, something that, that was a sinister contract, right? It was simply a, a quid pro quo that's where publishers said, we put a lot of work and add a lot of value and we take on a lot of um, upfront expense to do some value adds to, to your materials. One of the biggest value adds in the print environment was the distribution, right? The printing and mailing and sending out, communicating research results. With the internet, that contract has changed, right? Because we can communicate, we can do the distribution at very little marginal cost from you know, our computers anywhere in the world. Yet the contract in the copyright agreement has not been revised uh, fully to reflect that I can, I can go ahead and do this and you know, maybe on the, on the publisher side, you, you'll take something that's slightly different in terms of our contract. Um, you may be familiar with copyright transfer forms, right? What rights the publishers are asking you to sign over in exchange for them providing their, their goods and services. And they use the American Chemical Society, not because they're the worst offender or anything like that, but because uh, they have some really interesting uh, uh, restrictions that continue to apply in the digital environment, such as you're allowed to use up to 50 copies of your own article for your teaching purposes. Well, in a digital environment, why can't I you know, give my students access to all the papers, so anything that I want them to, to have access to when I've uh, actually written the paper? The other thing that's really interesting, and from the perspective of a publisher, that we absolutely recognize is if you get this copyright transfer form, um, usually it comes at the end of the process of your article being accepted and getting ready for publication, right? As a managing editor, one of the things I would do first thing in the morning would, you know, get to my desk and I'd send an email and say, we're missing your copyright transfer form. We want to slate your article for publication in the next uh, issue of the journal. But unless I have a signed copy, I can't get you into that issue. And invariably, I would either get it emailed a PDF copy signed back immediately or a fax copy signed back within like minutes. I know people weren't reading. Like in general, we just sort of take for granted that it must be okay. And that is something that we have um, really, really have to be much more deliberate and take the time to think about what is it that we're actually signing over and are there alternatives? Are there things that we could be doing that would ensure that what we want ultimately to be able to do with our articles and to articles from our colleagues um, were legally uh, able to do that in this environment. Uh, the, one of the, the other uh, uh, characteristics that um, we certainly run into, and Nicole talked about this in the textbook environment, is the, the, the restrictions on, on what this material actually costs. And I know that our librarians are intimately familiar with what it costs to pr provide access to journals. And again, we had a question earlier in the open textbook session about um, getting access to digital textbooks 
uh, this is getting access to digital versions of journals. It is least access for the, the period of the contract that your university has access to this material. Um, uh, you can see that the, the, the prices range all over the joint, um, but an average cost of $1,788 per title uh, across disciplines is an incredibly expensive um, proposition for, for most institutions to be able to think about uh, providing adequate access. Spark, as a membership organization, has libraries of all shapes and sizes. One of our largest libraries, MIT Libraries, estimates that even with their endowment and their budget, they're able to provide access to only about 70% of the journals that they would want to provide access for under subscription terms and conditions on their campus. Uh, so access is a real issue. This number is impressive enough, right? You know, that's, that's a large number, $1,788 to get access to a single title. But cumulatively, understand that journal publishing, where the articles that you're contributing to this process, where you're not paid for them, the publishers are making an enormous amount of revenue. It's roughly a $10 billion a year revenue producing industry. And to put that in perspective, that's roughly the same amount of revenue, slightly more than when I looked up the last statistic, as the National Football League made last year. So it is big business and it's huge profit making uh, 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 business. The two red bars, when we look at the average profit margins across industries, um, we have you know, some pretty solid players in you know, blue chip stocks in terms of Disney, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Exxon Mobil. Those are their relative profit margins over, uh, over um, uh, this was 2014, sorry, I had to look at my own slide. You can see that the commercial publishers throw off profits that exceed these commercial companies. And when you think about the supply chain for the materials that they're actually making money off of, we're contributing this material for free, so it's all upside for, for publishers. I do not begrudge anyone making a profit. I'm not anti-capitalist or anti-corporatist. I, I do believe, you know, look, we, we need revenue to survive. But I do think we have to think about what the, the, the relative um, balance might be that's more in line of actually serving the mission of the research enterprise besides putting 30 to 40 percent profit margins into shareholders pockets rather than potentially reinvesting a 40 percent profit margin on 10 billion dollars worth of revenue we could do a lot with that money in terms of research and and uh, 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 scientific uh, advancement so these are some of the drivers, right, sort of cumulatively that have led us to think about um, we, we might need to do something different. And you're all familiar with this, right? These barriers are not theoretical. They have a real impact on us on a daily basis. There's, I'd wager nobody who's in this room who hasn't gone through this exercise where you've done a literature search on something that you're interested in. My son has um, type 1 juvenile diabetes, so I'm constantly looking for information about how to stave off lows at night, which anybody who knows type one knows, you don't sleep a lot, right? So you do a literature search, you find a bunch of articles that you're in, you think you might be interested in reading more fully. You click on the abstract for one, you go, yep, you know, nocturnal hypoglycemia, insulin treated diabetes, this is it, this is what I wanna read. But before you can get to the full text, if you don't have a subscription at your institution, you come to a paywall that says, pay me $31 for the privilege of seeing if this might be something that you want to read. And I, I'm, I'm looking around the room, I don't think that there's anybody who hasn't run into this or doesn't run into this on a daily basis in your, in your work, or even in looking at something, looking for something that you're interested in. So the real question is, what do you do? Right? We've paid, spent a lot of time asking people, what is it that you do? And as the library community, we would love it if you all said, we go to you guys and ask for our library loan. Well, Okay, sometimes not so often, um, more common, I'll go straight to the author and ask the author for a copy. I may know them or you know, I'll just take a chance at shooting them an email. Or I'll get it from a colleague at an institution that I know might have a subscription. I'll send an email to my sister or somebody else. Or we're starting to get really creative. Um, I'll use the hashtag I can has PDF and ask for a copy that way we're beginning to see services now build up around this notion of, you know, how do I get copies to articles? The open access button is an app you can install on your computer. If you run into a, a paywall, push the button, it'll send a, a request to the author for a legally vetted copy. 
Unpaywall just emerged three weeks ago, another service that does a similar thing. It's an app you can download and you can begin to find free legally vetted copies. Why am I saying legally vetted copies? Because probably the thing that most people are doing and not talking about is getting non-legally vetted copies from pirate sites like Sci-Hub, which has the map, by the way, of the, the red and that, that, you guys are all familiar with Sci-Hub? Yeah. Okay, great. I don't have to explain the pirate site. The, the red on the map is the instances of use of Sci-Hub mapped around the world. And the headline says everything, right? We would like to think that, you know, at, People are, are, are always choosing the, the legally vetted um, mechanism, but in fact, very often, we're finding we have what you can only term as a black market for PDFs of scientific research articles. As ridiculous as that sounds, that is the reality. Um, there is an option though that we see happen every day that's worse than going to a pirate site. We hear time and time again, I decide, I make the calculus, I don't, maybe I don't need the article, I skip it, and I'll go on to something else. We end up doing our research on what we have access to. We end up teaching our students what we have access to, rather than what we might need to know or what they might really need to know. So the bottom line is that this system doesn't fully support our values or our core missions as individuals in the research enterprise or the values and the missions of the institutions that we're part of in the research and education enterprise. So we've really found this need to try to find a way to optimize the system for sharing research and education outputs to better suit the needs of individuals and of institutions. And that led us to, to the notion of using open as an enabling strategy and to the concept of trying to apply, flipping the default to open in this specific aspect of the system under what we call open access. And because words matter and definitions matter. I wanna make sure that we're on the same page in, in talking about what we're talking about when we talk about open access. We're not talking about open as in, I can get to an article and I have the ability to read it and, and I, don't have to, I don't have to hit a paywall. <coughs> we're talking about the need, a, 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 a definition of open that takes into account all of those barriers that we just you know, kind of talked about and provides us with me a mechanism to get around and take down those barriers. We, open access means the ability to freely, immediately access articles online, not only to read, but to use fully and legally in the digital environment. So the ability to text mine, the ability to bulk download, the ability to just download, the ability to text and data mine, to compute and to use for any legal purpose. That's the, the vision of the ideal operating environment for sharing articles that are reporting on scientific research and ideally also uh, the data that underpins those those um, those articles. Um, so we have this fantastic concept. It's about 15 years old. In fact, it is exactly 15 years old. Um, Valentine's Day is the anniversary of the uh, the meeting in Budapest that um, resulted in the terms, uh, the definition of open access, really kind of bursting onto the scene. And in those intervening 15 years. We've uh, created lots of different mechanisms to begin to enable this vision to turn into a reality. Like how do you implement? Like, okay, so what we're really talking about is replacing, ideally, the system of subscription access journals with outlets, starting with journals, that operate under the terms and condition of open access. And if you go to a resource called the Directory of Open Access Journals, you can find um, an index of roughly 9,000 and change open access journals that are operating under these terms and conditions in just about any discipline that you might want to publish in or you might be interested in uh, just about anywhere around the world. We're beginning to build up that piece of infrastructure to where there are options that are available in, in most disciplines that are reasonably high quality options as well. And in, I think I would like to rather than go into the notion of predatory journals or quality and, and really dig into that, because that's a pretty lengthy conversation, we can talk about that in the, in the Q&A. It's important, I'm not trying to dismiss it, but um, I want to acknowledge that, that that's a question. I also want to acknowledge that the um, open access publishing industry as an industry is be, has recognized that that's an issue and they are taking steps to, um, to do things like the DOAJ went through and re-reviewed the 10,000 and change journals that appeared in it two years ago and pulled out journals that did not meet editorial and peer review criteria 
established by the new Open Access Scholarly Publishers Trade Association. So best practices and quality um, um, assurance mechanisms are, are beginning to be built into uh, the infrastructure that we have as well. So one, one channel, one piece of infrastructure that's very important to support open access that's in place is uh, 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 obviously open access journals. But a second piece of infrastructure that's just as important um, are open access uh, archives or open access repositories, which are essentially community run, li oftentimes library run um, uh, repositories where you can place a copy of an article, even if you haven't published it in an open access journal, you can reserve the rights and pub uh, put a copy of your article into a repository so that it can still be shared openly with the community and can be discovered, can be used, and can be um, uh, part of the open corpus of literature. And this slide is one I really like because it's a mashup of the directory of open access repositories in Google Earth. And it shows the location of open access repositories on university campuses, college campuses, research institutions, government facilities. And you can really see that it reflects the idea and the reality that research is a global enterprise, that this is not something that is a geographically specific concept. The idea of open access is taking root all over the world um, and, and really supporting uh, the notion of research as a global enterprise. And then, of course, there's two other ways uh, that you can uh, uh, ensure that your, your work is um, part of the open corpus. I was going to say, like, is playing in the open space, but that sounded kind of ridiculous to think. I know I have this vision of a little article <laughs> dancing openly in a field. Um, uh, you, uh, there are um, uh, tremendous legal tools that are available to us from the Spark addendum, which you can simply attach to your copyright transfer form that will say, I just simply want to reserve the right to use my article in the teaching environment to something that's more robust, like open licenses. Uh, the Creative Commons a suite of open licenses are probably the most um, uh, well known and widely used licenses. They allow you to really dictate, you can retain copyright of your material but to um, give the right to users uh, to use your materials fully in the digital environment. All of the things that we articulated early and earlier in terms of um, wanting to be able to compute, text, data, mine, download, open licenses allow you to do while still ensuring that the work is correctly <coughs> attributed back to you, right? Attribution is one of the most important things in the academic environment um, and that it's used in a, legally, in a legal way. Um, we see all of these things also sort of percolating up into uh, um, uh, the, the minds of policymakers, whether they're on our institutions, in our state uh, legislatures, in our national governments, and even internationally. Um, and we've seen a real movement. Again, we have this hockey stick curve of an uptake and adoption of resolutions and policies, um, again, across all of these different uh, bodies to adopt policies that say, if you're, if you're working on this campus or if you're taking money from us as a public uh, funder of research, we expect that in exchange for being on this campus or you know, taking this money, that you are going to make articles that report on the work that you're doing openly available, either by publishing in an open access journal, by putting it in an open access repository, or by using an open license to enable uh, people to get to and you, you use your work in the, in the fullest possible way. So that's great, right? We have the concept set up, we have done tons of education, we have lots of infrastructure in place supporting the adoption of open access, and yet we find ourselves 15 years into this discussion, this movement, with only about roughly 20% of the total of all articles that are published being published using full open access terms. Um, which is, you know, a, 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 it's not perfect, right? And we have a long way to go. I would love it if we were at, we always said 50% was the tipping point. At 51%, I'm quitting and I'm going home. We're done. Um, we're not there. So we spent a lot of time thinking about if we know we have this better system that's open and we know we have this infrastructure in place, what, why aren't people using it? How do we get people to actually use it? And one of the things that we've recognized um, over long conversations, lots of visits, lots of um, discussions, is that we recognize that uh, we have to do a better job of demonstrating that the adoption of open access practices and, and policies will not only help 
society, right? Will not only you know help on the, the open is better than closed. I'm doing something to contribute to my discipline in an abstract way, but we also have to demonstrate that it will actually help individual researchers, faculty, students, administrators, members of the public do what they want to do with the materials that we're asking them to contribute to, to making open. Um, Self-interest is a really powerful motivator and it's not an, a negative motivator, right? We do research, we do our work, it's our life's blood and it's also what we get paid for and what we need to continue to ensure that we're going to be rewarded for in a meaningful way. Um, one of the things that we came to uh, the realization at Spark a couple of years ago was that part of the, the, the problem was structural and we'll talk about that in terms of how people are recognized for the rest of this talk, but it was also part of how we were talking about open access, right? We were talking about open access as if open access was the end to itself. You should support open access because open is good. Open access, you know, open access journals are better than closed access journals. But what we weren't doing was taking that statement to its next logical uh, level and connecting with the person that we wanted to sell on open access. You're a student, right? What, why, why, why would you want to do, why would you want to publish in an open access journal? It's not open for open sake, but open in order to. Open in order for you to make sure that your work is available to anybody that you might want to see it and the, that the benefits might accrue to you that are meaningful. Oh, if you're a researcher, opening up access to research articles in order to speed up progress towards a new discovery. Opening up access to research articles and data in order to prevent a Zika pandemic, right? Speed matters in the publications process. For an individual, whether you're a faculty member or a student, open up, up access to your articles in order to increase the visibility and impact of your work. Then we start to get into things where people go, that means something to me. Now, how does that work, right? Now you've got me. I'm like, great, I'd like to prevent a pandemic or, or, or speed discovery, but really what I wanna know is impact of my work. To me, that means I'm cited more. I'm read more and I'm cited more. Will publishing in an open access journal or putting your article in an open access repository return those results to you that you wanna see in terms of increased impact? And what we are seeing now, we're 15 years into it, we, we may only have 20% of the, the total literature under open access terms and conditions, but boy is that 20% studied pretty heavily to see whether or not there is a citation advantage. Right? The theory is if I make my work uh, openly available, more people can read it, more people who read it, the more people who will uh, uh, cite it, and the more people who will use it. Does that actually follow through? There's been a cohort of about, I think at this point it's more than um, 60, uh, some odd studies that have looked at the citations, at cite, the potential citation advantage for publication in an open access journal versus uh, in a traditional subscription access journal. And in discipline after discipline, you do see by and large, the, the preponderance of evidence shows that the, the level of citations goes up. Now it differs from discipline to discipline and that uh, citation advantage also has we, we only have a 15 year cohort, right, for a longitudinal study, so we don't know how long that will persist. But at least initially, one of the things that we can say with confidence is that we can help bring more readers to your work, more and more citations to your work. And while we continue to be judged by using citations as one of the primary measures, that's a very important thing to be able to say. Open in order to help you in, improve your citation and the impact of your work. Well. Impact is so much more than just citations. And in the open environment, one of the other advantages that we can come to people and say as individuals, we can help you look at other measures of impact that might be important to you and might ultimately be important to whoever is going to be evaluating your work and saying, you know, are, are you doing what we're, what we're giving you the funding to do or what we're, we're employing you to do? Um, a whole new range of, uh, of measures called um, alternative metrics or article level metrics that can actually be attached to your article in the, the open environment and return information to you in real time on a whole host of different aspects of your work are now available. And they can look at everything from citations, but across multiple um, uh, citation sources to just pure usage. How many times has your article been downloaded? But it can also look at conversations that are happening around your article in the blogosphere, in, so, in social media, whether it's professional so, social media like sites like Conatea or Site You Like, or just in regular social media. It's really interesting as a journal publisher, kind of moving journals online, 
we thought one of the first things that was going to happen were that uh, scientists and researchers were going to want to attach comments to articles and have conversations about them, you know, in real time with the articles. You know, it, it's like a non-starter. It's it, you know, incredibly puzzling that that hasn't taken off. But they'll use Twitter and Facebook discussions to talk about work like there's nobody's business. It's like being in the hallway of a meeting and overhearing conversations sometimes when you follow a Twitter thread on uh, people talking about articles that have just come out. Um, you can also uh, follow conversations about mentions of your work or discussions of your work in uh, the, the regular media, in uh, trade publications or across uh, the popular press. It tells a fuller story about who's about where your work is being used, who's using your work in many instances, you go back to the identification of some of these, these folks and different kinds of impact that your work is having um, in terms of uh, reach, public engagement, um, all types of different aspects. And this is just a really quick example of what this looks like sort of in practice. This is uh, an example of um, article level metrics in PLOS attached to one article. And you, know, you, you can see this is a, a relatively new article. It's only been out for about eight months and it has somewhere around 45,000 views. Is that good or bad? Well, only you know the context of the work that you've done, but also you know, your colleagues will also understand the context. If you thought 10 of your closest friends were gonna be interested in this article and that's it, you're gonna be pretty happy with this kind of a, a result. Um, but then again, if you thought this was a Nobel groundbreaking piece of work, you might be a little concerned over, well, why am I only getting 45,000 downloads? And um, at the same time, if you scroll down this page, you start to see the other, other aspects of, of information where you can find out additional information about this work. So it's not surprising that after eight months, there are only a couple of citations that have cropped up to this piece. Citations tend to come uh, farther down the pike, but something's happening on Facebook. So people are talking about this article on Facebook and you can take that, you can click on that tab, you go straight to the conversation about the article on Facebook and you can find out more about who's talking about my stuff and what are they saying? It's a really interesting way to determine different kinds of impact um, around your work. And it's really only available to us in the open environment, right? Where these, these kinds of measures can be enabled and have the freedom to live and to return information to you and to people that you might want to share this information with about your work. Um, two, three other very quick things that I wanna mention uh, that the open environment helps us enable that are big concerns of us as individuals in the research community is that we often have a, a, a paper that we're ready to publish, an idea we wanna to get to market. And again, I say this with all love and respect, having been a journal publisher, two journal publishers, we submit the article and then we wait. And we can wait in disciplines for up to a year for a paper, sometimes more, to be accepted, to go through the review process, um, I actually gave this talk on a campus and somebody yelled back at me and go, the year would be good. And I was like, okay, sorry, <laughs> I don't know what your discipline is, but we tried our hardest in you know, the life sciences to, to, to speed things up. But speed of publication, communication, registration of an idea is a vital component of the conduct of research. And we hear so often, we've got this internet, right, created by scientists for scientists to share science. Why can't we register or communicate our ideas immediately? Why, why do we have to wait? So thinking about the open environment to enable us to, when we're ready, to be able to communicate our idea and understand that there might be different ways for us to do this that come with, with pros and cons. Uh, you know, of course, it's not just faster isn't always better, but in the, the communication of research, we want that option. Can we enable that option? And the open environment can allow us to do this, in particular through the use of sites that are beginning to gain more popularity, like preprint sites, Archive is an, a long time site in physics and astronomy, but over the last year and a half, we've really seen a resurgence of interest across disciplines with the establishment and the population the use of preprint servers to begin to establish the provenance of the idea, register the idea, and then to think about using that environment to communicate that, that result initially and think about layering peer review on top of those kinds of servers. So it's an interesting, it's, you could view it almost as an end run around journals, although archive has certainly not replaced journals in physics and astronomy. It has the potential to evolve into something where communication is enabled in the open environment and you can layer peer review on top of it. And in particular, you can think about 
the issues you might have with anonymized, you know, dual reviewer um, peer review and think about, do I want to have the comments open? Do I want to look at addressing issues that are also of deep concern to me as an individual researcher of potential bias hidden behind anonymity in the peer review process? The open environment has all of these different um, elements of uh, uh, opportunity for us to consider um, taking advantage of. So it's good stuff. That's great. And we talk about this, we've got that self-interest, right? We, we, we see people begin to shake their heads, but we recognize that none of this will, will come to fruition. We'll still be at 20, maybe we'll get to 25% because a, a larger audience is interested in utilizing alternative metrics or taking advantage, advantage of preprint servers. We're still gonna get stopped cold when, they, when researchers turn around and say, I'd like to do it, but when it comes time for my evaluation, for funding, for tenure, for promotion, if I'm not credited for taking those actions in the same way or better than I am for publishing in a traditional subscription access journal, then I'm not gonna do it. And we recognize that that is probably the single biggest lever that needs to be pushed and solved properly in order for open to take root across our campuses. And you're all as more familiar, I'm sure, with this process as, uh, than I am. But currently our institutions, whether they're funding agencies, whether they're academic or research institutions, um, we rely heavily on journal brands and impact factors in tenure and promotion decisions in the section that, that talks about uh, you know, your publication productivity. We have um, a set of uh, uh, young researchers that are currently collecting tenure and promotion guidelines from institutions around the United States and in Canada. And when we read them, we're stopped cold often because in some departments they'll say, you have to publish in Science Nature. They'll say the name of the journal that counts more in terms of you know, being credited in your tenure and promotion uh, process. Or they'll say you must have at least seven articles that are published in journals that have impact factors of six or higher. Um, and you sit there and you look and you say, this is, this is a system begging to be gamed, right? This is, and it's also a system that's keeping us locked into uh, a, a very specific mode. The idea of journal impact factors, do, do folks know what journal impact factors actually measure? <laughs> so the comment from the audience here was they're completely corrupt. Never mind what they measure, but they're completely corrupt. It's, it's a gameable system. It's a system that's gamed. But what I, I just want to point out that we think sometimes that impact factors tell us something about an individual article. What they actually tell us about is the average time a collection of articles have been cited in a journal over a two-year period. So it's, it's a proxy for the, the citation um, uh, numerical citation indicator in a set of journals. And yet we, we, we tend to think that somehow because I'm in that collection, that must mean my article is, you know, getting the same amount of citations. It's, it's a proxy that was useful to, and I'm going to, you know, sort of duck and cover to, to librarians before we were able to um, have different ways of tracking the, on, the use of our journals. When we used to, to rely on shelving statistics, to figure out like, do people care about the, the journals that we're buying for you in our libraries? It was, we'd look at the carts at the end of the day and you know, on our checklist, write down what, num what how many times we put that journal back on a shelf. Impact factors evolved as a way to supplement that very inexact science with a slightly less inexact, but by no means perfect measure. And yet we've adopted it and used it as if it's telling us something that's a, a, a gold standard. And reliance on these proxies really, as you know, keeps pressure on scholars to continue to choose traditional commercial subscription-based outlets. Um, so where we are now is that we have to work to ensure that our institutional incentives, and I'm using institutional in the broadest possible sense, and our rewards are aligned with our end goals and our missions. If we look at impact factor and we say, is this, are we using this measure, are we rewarding a measure that actually is going to have a positive impact on what we're in business to do here at this school, right? I also pulled uh, uh, Minds' mission statement. I pulled your mission and value statement. So I'm gonna go through just three slides very quickly um, the, uh, from your website. Solving the world's challenges, right? Um, uh, uh, educating students and creating knowledge. 
if you look at the use of impact factor, if you look at the use of rewarding publication in a specific journal title, how is that an enabling strategy that, that fuels this core mission? In particular, if the journals with the impact factors in questions are under subscription control, so they're reaching a smaller audience rather than the widest possible audience. Um, additionally, Colorado uh, Minds' value statement talks about a, a student-centered institution focused on collabor collaboration, creativity, lifelong learning, responsibility for developing a better world. Are the indicators that we're being judged on actually in line with the value statement? Now, the library isn't going to be probably the unit that is leading the charge to have this discussion, but we can raise these questions and ask these questions in a, in a productive environment that can help us think about uh, perhaps making the case that open, open access to articles, open access to data, open access to educational resources is an enabling strategy that the university might want to consider supporting in order to better support getting to uh, uh, achieving the aims of the core mission and values. And can we make that case? And I think the answer is that we absolutely can. I think we have to work together to be able to articulate this. This is an, an early sort of, uh, conversation that we're starting to have, not only on our campuses, but also uh, with funders writ large. But we can think about using that nomenclature of open in order to and fill in the blanks to the, you know, when we're talking to the administration about uh, what, why do we want to do this? Why should you care about open? open up, opening up access to articles produced on our campus in order to promote the creation and dissemination of knowledge, which as you know, is in our mission statement in black and white, opening up access to articles in order to contribute to real time collaborations to solve big problems and improve the public good, which is in our mission statement and also in our value statements. Opening up access to articles in order to increase public engagement with university output, which is also part of the mission of the university. And I think it's really important to, to, to remember that the conversation shouldn't just be limited to thinking about how do we fill in the blank for opening up access to, right? I, I use three examples of, of opening up access to articles, but fill in the blanks using opening up access to data, opening up access to educational resources, and see where you can, where you can get. And the next step of doing that is that we're going to have to figure out how then we would suggest people track and, and uh, uh, um, measure to a certain degree the, these kinds of outcomes. In terms of opening up access to data, opening up access to articles, it's probably a little bit easier, right? We have the al al alternative metrics, article level metrics that give us a beginning place to have that conversation and to begin to point to tools that we could say, you know, if, do we really value the, the breadth of the reach of materials coming from this campus? If, if so, we might want to use ALMs that point to you know, full downloads, or we might want to be able to incorporate some of the other AM, ALMs into our tenure and promotion guidelines or things that are, are just considered in our packets. From the data environment, I think this is where things really get interesting and where we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible. Um, we're seeing platforms now being developed that are open platforms like um, Synapse is an open platform used by a consortium that's looking at open source drug development in the oncology space. And the platform was actually created to help the team share their data and work on their data collaboratively on multiple sites in real time. But what Synapse does that's different than you know, just a, you know, a, 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 a fig share or a, a, a data sharing site is it actually has annotation tools that allow you to say, this is the work I did on this data set, right? I was responsible for scrubbing this data set, or I did this annotation, or I was the one who was responsible for running creating this particular code and running this algorithm on this data. It's identified in real time, it's registered, and you can then suddenly say, oh my gosh, like a data citation, it's something I can pull out, aggregate, and talk about in my CV, whereas I'm, I'm almost never, never credited for the work that I do getting my hands dirty in data, yet it's such a critical contribution to advancing our disciplines in the digital age. Why wouldn't we want to be rewarded for it um, we need to have these kinds of mechanisms that, that uh, support it as well. And I'm just going to close by uh, reiterating that when we're talking about having this conversation and continuing this conversation about realigning incentives and rewards to be more in line with our individual goals and missions and values and our institutional goals, it can't just be academic institutions. I somewhat 
facetiously but really seriously said the library community is not going to be the leading voice in promoting tenure and promotion reform we're, we're simply not positioned to be um, effective in doing that however we we can be effective in using our expert our expertise and our convening roles in helping to make sure that the right players are thinking about these questions and moving in the right direction towards empowering uh, 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 the reward of open behaviors in the in, in the research environment and research funders right now I think hold the keys to the kingdom right you often hear the the phrase when you're trying to solve a problem follow the money well we've been following the money back to library budgets and that's good but that's not where it originates right that's just where it originates to to funds uh subscriptions and potentially to put some money into pots to, to support oer or open data projects the source of the money is research funders public and private and those funders have missions and goals and values that are directly aligned with our research and academic institutions and if they have the same conversation about rewarding the behavior of open in order to achieve their core missions uh, like the gates foundation has done by saying if you take money from the gates foundation you have to agree to make all articles and data that report a result from and report on that work openly available using the appropriate cc license on day one from here on out and they said we are doing this because it is the mission of the gates foundation to and per, in particular our global health initiative to save lives and in the press release of a, a new group of funders that Gates helped spark to put together called the Open Research Funders Group, it, it, the Gates Foundation uh, lead was quoted as saying, open in order to save lives, right? Their mission is this is an enabling strategy. It is crucial. There is no reason to lock this up. So we are going to require it. And now we have to talk about how we're going to reward this behavior. This group of funders right now is Numbers about eight, it's the Sloan Foundation, the Soros Foundation, the Gates Foundation, uh, the Arnold Foundation, so big players in the research uh, enterprise, totaling somewhere around $6 billion annually in investments in the research environment that are working together to talk about these issues and to try to harmonize their approaches, their policies, and their ideas for how to move open uh, as into the default mode in the research environment having the research funders talk with our research institutions and academic institutions about this is probably the way that we're going to be able to, to make change, right? To say the conversation's introduced by the library community. Okay, interesting. The conversation is introduced on your campus by the head of the Gates Global Initiative. Maybe a slight difference in terms of how the message is received and what we have the opportunity to do. So it's something that we're working very hard to, to try to promote um, right now. Um, I'm just going to close by saying, you know, the reason that Sparks in this game is to set the default to open. And we, we want you to all think also about open in order to what's possible if we all work collectively uh, to set the default to open and actively reward people for moving in that direction. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Um, let's take maybe the five minutes for, for a few questions and we can continue our conversation at 1.30 or more. Yes. Are there any model institutions of higher education that you can point us to that are shifting the conversation on the reward structure for tenure? So the question was, are there any model institutions that we can point to? There are a handful of institutions that are beginning to do that. Um, Indiana University, Purdue, I think has, is the one that's the, the most visible in terms of saying we're actually going to uh, amend our tenure and promotion guidelines to include uh, talking about discussions of have you published in an open access journal, have you made your data set openly available. But I think that that is the strategy that we would like to uh, see um, uh, uh, get more visibility and that we would like the research funders to be able to help us with encouraging academic institutions to become exemplars and high visibility institutions to become exemplars. The initial strategy that we're talking about is to ask the National Academies to convene a meeting, maybe a two-day workshop where you bring funders, faculty, and administrators together, ask the question, are the incentives and rewards that you're currently um, promoting uh, in line with the, the values and the goals of your institution. We know that a priori that the answer is gonna be, well, not, no, not perfectly. 
So the meeting would be about, so can you make, can this group begin to make some recommendations about steps that could be taken to change that? What should we be rewarding? Um, and having that convened under the academy, I think is the, the kind of neutral sort of um, high level cachet that we need to have this conversation be effective. But out of that meeting, hopefully have a handful of research funders and a handful of institutions commit to being the exemplars, to trying this and seeing, reporting back, you know, sort of the lather, rinse, repeat, refine model of, of moving forward. I think exemplars are going to be crucial in, in this endeavor. Yes. Um, so you talked about, you know, the institution, the faculty role, the funders role. What do you see as the publisher's role in this movement? Because as you said, they do still add value, even if they're not providing that dissemination yeah. value. Yeah. Um, so where do they fit into this? So, I mean, publishers continue to play, I think, the important role of you know, organizing peer review in uh, under sort of the traditional uh, auspices. You can see a role, I mean, I immediately was looking at the idea of preprint servers when they came up, at, when they be, became more prominent, and the idea of layering open peer review on top of it. You're thinking, well, this is really interesting. This could become the Wild West really quickly. So what's the role that what, what do we need? We kind of need grown-ups in this environment. And I went immediately to scholarly societies organizing some mechanisms around the, it, whether it's open, whether it's closed, that you could see them transitioning into away from we've got to do this, this full, we've got to do the traditional journal publishing only into our expertise as a guild around disciplinary knowledge. How do we apply it so that we're actually achieving the aims of our scholarly societies, which I mean, I don't think they've changed since I worked for scholarly societies, which was the promotion of the discipline, right? And I think it's, we're, we're right in line. Will commercial publishers do as well in this environment? I, I don't think that the opportunities are as large as they are now because they will not be the only game in town. And that is where, that's the world we're living in now. So um, from publishers absolutely add value. The opportunities look different. They will not be hopefully around providing access to primary content, but rather around providing true value added services that are, that are um, priced appropriately. Yes. You alluded earlier to the ACS uh, copyright. What are the chances, I mean, I, this isn't a commercial question. What are the chances of basically having or presumably discussions going on with ACS, APS, what have you, in terms of making that copyright agreement less restrictive? Um, the question was around having conversations with uh, not-for-profit publishers like ACS, APS, physics or physiology, doesn't matter physics. either, <laughs> or psychology, uh, any discipline around making their copyright transfer, uh, their copyright policies more um, perhaps academy friendly would be the, the right. We've had lots of conversations. Um, we created the Spark Author Addendum as a way to open the conversation. Uh, the Spark Author Addendum is just a, a you know, small little document that says, I want to reserve these specific rights. I attach it to the copyright transfer form. I submit my article um, as uh, usual. That has tended to result in a back and forth conversation. Um, I can tell you that when I started my job as executive director at Spark, I had submitted an article that had been accepted to an Elsevier library publication. And I said, oh, we have this new author addendum, I better try it. So I submitted it and Elsevier immediately sent it back as, you know, we don't know what this is, we're not taking it. And I walk a mile in an author's shoes, my first reaction was, well, it doesn't work, I'm not doing this. And then I thought, oh, I'm being paid to do this, so maybe I better, you know, grow a spine and send it back and say, here's what it is. And we had a, an eight email exchange back and forth, and this was 11 years ago. Uh, before Elsevier gave up and said, T take your full copyright, just leave us alone. <laughs> uh, that obviously is not the outcome that you're going to get every time. But what we have seen is by critical mass of authors doing this in different disciplines, the vast majority of publishers, including ACS, have taken steps to amend their copyright policies. But 85% of all publishers will now allow you to post in a preprint server before you, but, 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 and still consider your article for um, publication in their journal. You know, earlier, early days, that would have been unthinkable. That was pre-publication, it, it constitutes publication, people could get to it, you're not allowed to submit that. Um, classroom use, that, those terms have been, by many publishers, radically changed. ACS has been slightly slower to move, but I will say that the one thing that gives me 
great optimism, hope, great uh, cause for optimism is that they recently announced that they are going to begin a preprint server in, uh, in, in chemistry that the ACS will actually be running. So whether it's signs that things are softening in that particular discipline, and if you're a chemistry librarian, you might be able to. Yes. Well, I just want to mention that the ACS is trying to say they're going to lead the effort to, to, to run the oh. chem, chem, chem archive services, uh, server. They, they don't want to say they are going to run because it's a conflict of interest. Okay, so they're going to lead the effort to promote establishing a chemical yeah, exactly. uh, preprint server. <laughs> That's a step in the right direction. So we'll take it. You yes. Make, you know, one of the things you alluded at the beginning, and you're absolutely right, that we normally, I normally don't pay a lot of attention to these things. I just sign and get, thank God it's been cut through the yeah. So yeah. Cut. But the issue that concerns me about that is that technically, I'm sure that ACS could come after me tomorrow for getting things promulgated in ways that effectively have violated the agreement with them. And at some level, it seems to me it would, you know, as an intermediate step toward this way, is to at least make faculty members more aware, okay, of where these boundaries are. And so when we get a, a, a reprint request to somebody like that, we'll say, sure, here it is. Oh, wait a minute, I have to think about it. Yeah. Uh, the, the question was um, uh, that, that or the observation was that, yes, it is in fact pretty common that you don't read your copyright transfer before you sign it. I mean, that while we're still in the transition between where we are now and a fully open world where you would never have to worry about that, right? In an open access world, I mean, the, the barriers, that friction goes away. So that's sort of the ideal operating environment. Um, uh, how can you, how, what can we do to make sure that authors are as educated as possible? Um, both, there's three, three organizations that are running uh, campaigns to, to uh, educate authors. Uh, they're called author rights campaigns. Spark is one. We have a whole series of resources that we can make sure you have on this campus to distribute. Um, there's an organization called the Authors Alliance that was started up a couple of years ago that works not only on journal articles, which is where Spark's expertise is, but also on books, monographs, um, other materials. They can provide you with guidance about, okay, what am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? And increasingly, we see Creative Commons, who are the originators of the, the suite of open licenses that really are the definitional licenses in the open movement. Um, they have some resources to help individual authors as well. So one of the things that we can do is work through the library to make sure that those resources are available on campus and hopefully uh, make sure that there's um, channels that, that faculty and students know you can come to the library and they can, they can, they can help. They can point you in the right direction in this transitional phase. So I don't know how much I understand in all of these things, right? but I know that when one option that they have just before I, I will never quite submit the copyright agreement is, is to publish it open access. That's always cost more than one thousand yes. dollar. And if I have many projects that I publish the papers, plus fifty percent overhead, everything, you know, that yeah. becomes pretty expensive. Yes. So the question was about the cost of publishing open access, and in particular, the model that asks authors to pay article processing charges, or shorthand is APCs. And that is a model that has been increasingly adopted by publishers. Um, it is a model that we are not particularly supportive of because we do not believe it's a sustainable model for the community. That it was a, a model that, you know, started as, well, okay, let's try this. And then I think when you see commercial publishers adopting something with great alacrity, you know there's probably a rub there that, that, that uh, they're seeing a way to make money. What we've seen is that this, this particular business model is an additional uh, revenue stream for publishers over and above subscription revenues um, in something called hybrid journals, right? You can, buy the, you can buy the ability to have your article be an open article, article in a subscription access journal. And the, the funds generally tend to come from either campus funds that the library or labs run, or uh, increasingly, uh, it's covered as an allowable cost under your research grants, right? If you're lucky to be in, in a discipline where there's enough money to cover that, this, these kinds of costs. That's what we would like to see, that practice we would like to see stopped. 
And we would like to have, again, the research funders are crucially important in this conversation for uh, 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 defining new models for supporting open access communication of research results, because every funder will tell you now that they've acknowledged this, that the communication of results is part and parcel of the research process, right? That if they fund you to do research and you can't or you won't communicate the results, there is no value in them having invested in that research in the first place. They are now beginning and part of the reason that we've been working to convene the funders together to have these conversations to figure out, okay, what's the value proposition? We want to support the communication of these results. What does that mean? And can we do something collectively to encourage the support of funds for communication that, you know, they're, they're look, doing everything from looking at if APCs are the model, do we put a cap on what, what's an allowable cost? Or do we want to encourage other kinds of models to be created? And I think as academic, uh, and research libraries and, and institutions, we're very interested in looking at collective models, cooperative models that are in use to support other industries, to support the bulk production and provision of open access articles and, and channels to communicate those articles. So instead of saying, well, the library is just gonna flip our, the current money that we have supporting subscriptions into supporting article processing fees and we'll all have open access, well, we still have a market where the costs are gonna be out of control, we're interested in saying, if we looked at that money, we pulled out of the subscription deals that we have, what are things that we could reinvest individually and collectively in that would be better sustainable channels for our researchers to be able to friction, frictionlessly, if that's a word, I think I might've made it up, and seamlessly share the work that you're doing under these open terms and conditions. And so I think you know we don't want people to get locked into the notion of thinking open access equals author pays equals APCs, uh -uh. early stage transitional mechanism must get past it, working hard to get past it. Okay, one more question. Yes, please. The big, long answer, but you know, skip it. Uh, cybersecurity models, uh, are you more exposed than the current methods or, because you know, you're, you know, we want people to share data and so mm -hmm. manipulate this data to, that's a good question. I mean, the question was uh, cybersecurity in an open models. Are you more exposed to um, data manipulation or you know changing potentially changing your article if it's available openly? Um, I do. That's I, I would say that that probably is a long answer. The, the short answer is probably yes. Right. If if you're not trying to put any, we're not trying to put any blocks to anybody accessing this material. So intuitively, you would say yeah, you're more vulner vulnerable, but part of the characteristics of, of a commons or of an open environment tends to be that there's more eyes on this material. So there are more opportunities to detect rather than a, you know, a sort of a single Trojan horse entrance. And there are, other, there are more um, uh, uh, interventions or, or um, uh, things that you can think about doing in response than you, than you potentially have in a closed environment. And maybe we can talk a little bit more in the 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 converse, the Q and A, informal Q and A about that, because I'm getting the high sign from me that I'm going on. Yeah, thanks. Let, let's thank uh, Heather again for this wonderful conversation. And so, yeah, I'm sorry for being a bad, bad timekeeper, but thanks for your patience to stay uh, for this now. And we are gonna come back in 15 minutes again for uh, a, a more. Um, uh, Close conversation and with to ask more specific questions and to discuss. We're having a them. closed conversation on open. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I meant we. <laughs> teasing you. Close. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, I do. Before we go, I do want to thank everyone who helped us to make this event happen, including our own library and IT colleagues, and also the colleagues from all, all across the. Uh, six sponsoring libraries, and uh, without everyone's effort, this won't be true. Or this won't be happening at all today. So, and thank you very much for your partic participation. And uh, let's take a fifteen minutes break. Thank you. Mm -hmm. These are the years to get over the.